This is a short introduction to the new online utility, OpenID Connect Inspector. So first of all, where is the utility? If you go to our developer's website and then click on the docs link, you'll see here the various services we have. But if we go down to OpenID Connect, you see a new link here called Inspector, which takes us to the online utility. The first thing you will uh, need to do here is to actually add a client configuration that this online utility could use. You can see here I've actually already added one and there's a little warning here about the, the fact that this is a test utility and you, sh you shouldn't uh, uh, obviously use this as, an, as a production quality uh, tool at all. Fundamentally, this is a tool that's great for demonstrating OpenID Connect functionality, uh, for doing your own uh, customer testing perhaps, uh, or even using it as a learning uh, resource. So before we can actually add that client configuration there, we need to have a suitable application configured in one login. So what you would do is you would go to add an app and search for OIDC and you'll see our standard template connector. Okay, so as it happens, I already have mine set up. So if I go look for my particular app, it's it's this one. So quickly through the configuration here, um, here you see that I've got a login URL set. So it's important to understand that OpenID Connect, unlike uh, SAML, does not have the concept of an IDP initiated flow. In other words, it's up to the client to request the token. So it's analogous to a SAML service provider initiated flow. But at the same time, we want to be able to provide links to the given application within your one login portal. So that's what this login URL is. It's simply a, a redirect that will, uh, when a user clicks on it in their one login portal, will take them to the entrance point to the application. Um, whether that application link then redirects directs them automatically um, uh, to uh, request a token as part of an authentication process, well, that's up to that particular application. Um, but that's what that link is for. Additionally, uh, we need the concept of a redirect URI. Um, this is where one login will redirect the user to after authentication is completed. Um, and so uh, you can see here, the user is going to be taken back to the inspector app uh, to present uh, the tokens that are requested back to the client application. In terms of parameters, the default one that you'll normally see from the template is the groups um, parameter. But as you can see, you can add on in other parameters to allow you to transfer other identity information. And we'll look at that uh, a little bit later. In terms of single sign-on, you will see here by creating this connector, it's actually defined a unique client ID and secret. Um, so in this case, you would grab those two values because that's effectively the information we need to in inject into the client configuration. So you can see here the client ID has been added um, into my particular configuration, having used this add client option to put in the client ID, client secret, and the name. Okay. Um, some other configuration settings of note, um, the application type can either be web or native, not a huge difference between the two. Um, effectively, uh, what that means is if you're defining a native application, so like a, a mobile app, it allows you to define a redirect URI that's a custom scheme rather than it just being HTTPS. The token endpoints are a little dependent upon the actual flows that are used. Um, but the idea here is when a client ID and, and, and secret are presented to one login uh, in order to obtain a token, one login obviously needs to validate those credentials, so it needs to know where to look. So the client can either send the client ID and secret in a basic authorization header inside a post payload, or in the case of more secure um, uh, deployments using the authorization code flow. Instead of worrying about storing a secret and, and is it uh, securely stored or is it vulnerable, we don't use a client secret at all in that case, but we do need to use a cryptographic mechanism to add the security we need called PIXI or proof key of code exchange. Um, you can also set timeouts for an access token and a refresh token. Currently, uh, if an identity token is returned, it's got a hard-coded limit of uh, two hours, uh, although there is a request in to make that configurable as well. Uh, naturally, in terms of access, you just assign uh, the roles that you uh, wish to uh, be 
required in order to gain access to this application. Cool. Okay, so I've set that up at my end. So now if I go and look at the uh, client uh, configuration here within the inspector application, you go and add that um, client in. You can see I've given it a name of MD Demo. Now I'm in a position where I can go and do a test. So first thing to note is that the US and EU shards are obviously separate. So you need to define um, which shard you're connecting to. My tenant is in the EU, so make sure I change this. Otherwise, if you try and send a request to the wrong shard, you'll get some sort of error about the client ID being invalid. So you choose your clients. I'm using my uh, MD demo, which connects to um, that particular application in my tenant, as you've just seen. You can see here this utility allows us to try out two different grant types, the implicit flow and also the authorization code flow. Um, there are two other commonly used flows, which would be the um, resource owner password credential flow and the client credentials flow. Those two flows do not use a browser at all, so you can't use this sort of online utility to, to adequately test. And so that's where you'd probably use something like Postman. But for right now, I'm going to use the implicit grant uh, to show you a few things. Um, the response type here is ID token. In other words, I'm just requesting an identity token, but I could also request an access token as well. Um, the minimum scope we need to send is open ID to show it's an open ID flow, but we'll look at some of the other scopes later on. The state and nonce are unique uh, random strings which are used uh, for security purposes to protect against cross site scripting and replay attacks. So, I'm going to send a request to the EU implicit grant and I'll just uh, request the ba basic open ID scope. So I'll press authenticate. So one login needs to know who I am before it can respond. So I will authenticate as a test user. No MFA required in this particular case. So now I'll be redirected back to the redirect URI, back to the inspector, and it will send along the uh, identity token. So you can see here it was successful. That was the request there that was sent, and I can see what an identity token looks like. So an identity token is in um, a JOT format, as it's pronounced, a JSON web token. Um, so it's a digitally signed message, so it can be validated by the client. You can see the relevant identity information being pulled out. So this is the baseline information, including an expiry interval, which is uh, uh, two hours since um, uh, it was issued. Additionally, as I say, there is a signature there. But I can change some of the things I'm looking for. If I can reset the flow first of all. So I need to say which grant type I'm going to use. I'm going to use implicit again. This time I'm going to also look at the profile scope, which is a bit of a catch all scope that will um, uh, present more identity information that we know about that user. I didn't have to re-authenticate there because obviously this browser has a session uh, to one login, but there is a, a string that can be added um, to the request that will always force a re-authentication if you require. But you can see this time additional information has been returned, including custom values. So there is uh, an enhancement in at the moment to restrict this. So that has to be explicitly configured before allowing a release of the additional custom fields. But right now, all custom field values will be returned as well. So that's what the profile scope gives, gives us. Additionally, if I reset once again, I can also go and request the group scope. Okay. Again, don't need to re-authenticate, so I just get the JSON web token back. Um, and you can see here, I've got the grouped value. So in this case, this is specifically relating to this parameter here, where as you can see, I'm sending the user roles, but I could also obviously send group information here. So these are my roles, okay? Finally, there's another scope that we can use. Again, if I reset implicit and this time if I use the params scope basically that is a custom scope that we have that allows the administrator to specify additional values that we wish to be returned so you can see these additional values which is to do with the additional parameters that the user has specified here. So in this case, I'm returning member of as one of those custom parameters, which is now my sort of AD synced um, group membership as well. So we can extract different information depending on the nature of the scopes that are sent. Also, if I can just show you 
how you can request a different type of response. So in addition to the identity token, I can also request an access token as well. So again, if I authenticate here, I get the identity token same as before, but now I also receive uh, an access token. Now this is currently not in, um, in JOT format, it is um, just uh, basically a string, uh, an opaque string, so there's no identifying information in there, but it can be used for controlling access. This can be sent to a resource server so that that resource server can then go and talk to the OpenID Connect user info endpoint to obtain the identity information rather than um, the, the client being sent the um, identity token in the in, in response to the initial request okay so there are a few different things that we can do there with the implicit uh, grant so it's very useful to learn and, and see what the requests are you can take a header capture if you wish to see more detail um, this time what I'm going to do is to show you the more common grant type that you'll work with with which is the authorization code grant this is uh, considered to be the most secure of the available OpenID Connect grants. So in this case, it becomes a two-step process. Implicit is just sending a request, and in that response, you actually get the identity token and optionally the access token. With an authorization code, um, in response, you initially get just a code hence the name. And that code is then exchanged via a back channel connection between the client application and uh, one login to obtain the identity and access tokens and as we'll say, refresh tokens as well. So this is where I need to define um, basic post and non as the means of transferring the client ID and, and generally the, the secret other than when it's set to none. Um, and that obviously needs to match what is configured in the, uh, the application that we've defined here. Please take care. There is a 10 minute cache on any changes to this setting. So if you, if you are playing around and changing one setting, don't be surprised that it will fail for a short period of time uh, during that cache interval. Um, in the steady state, that's not an issue at all because once this is configured and you've decided which way you're going to do that, you will never change it. Um, but for when you're initially testing it, it can be slightly uh, annoying. So just be aware of that. So I'm using the um, uh, basic authorization header for the second request to obtain the token. You see the response type here is different. So it's code this time. Again, I've just got the open ID scope. So don't forget, I have already authenticated. So I'm not going to be authenticated again by one login. And you can see as a result of that initial request, I now have this authorization code, which is just an opaque pointer. There's no identity information in here. So now the client would need to make a second request to basically exchange this code for the resultant um, tokens. So you can see here, I have the identity token. So it's just like before with the implicit flow, but it took two requests in order to obtain it. Um, I've also getting uh, an access token and also a refresh token because generally an access token would have a short time period um, to uh, protect it from compromise. When that uh, runs out or expires, then the refresh token can be used to request an additional um, access token. Great, so if you uh, want to test beyond this, then I suggest you should use uh, Postman where you can test all of the available flows. And don't forget that we have the documentation to go with uh, with our OpenID Connect handling. So where the, um, sorry, so where the link is to inspect, you'll see the relevant API reference for the various um, uh, flow types, the four standard flow types we support, um, as well as how, um, whoever receives that, those tokens can validate them, how tokens can be refreshed, how you can subsequently request user info on, on presentation of an access token. Okay.